To be holy means to be close to God. And we can never be too close to God. Our charism, our special gift, is having an experience. We name it as having a deep experience of God's goodness, knowing God's compassionate care, leading us to share that. To be examples and conveyors of unifying love. It's about unifying love in the dear neighbor. First of all, develop a deep love for God. And from that, meet the needs we see in society. So it was always very flexible. I think that was one of the greatest things. And so as Ursulines, I think we've, through the years, appreciate St. Angela more and more, and we've come to try to meet the needs of society as they are and as they change. As I reflect on those early years of the congregation, some qualities of the founders have become the spirit, or what you and I call charism, that make up our DNA from our early sisters we have inherited the spirit because they creatively responded to the needs of the times. They trusted in God, committed to a mission to help those in need. They were resilient. They had stick-to-itiveness or perseverance. They had a pioneer spirit and they were willing to try new things. They were risk takers and they faced each day with courage. Risk takers from the very beginning. And so as time went on, so many of our ministries had a risk-taking sense to it. Just to name a few, we had St. Anne's Hospital, which was a hospital for unwed mothers, who would have thought. And then we opened a DePaul Infant Home for unwed mothers who were about to give birth to their children and protected them and kept them safe. And then they had their babies at St. Anne's. I did work with people that were HIV positive in my own ministry. And so that was something that no one was doing at that time. We kind of look for those ministries that weren't being attended to. And so I always thought of us as the risk takers, the ones that would go out there on the edge and take the risk with the people that were on the edge. So we were in primary and secondary education, but it really wasn't our first charism. It was, the, it was a need at the time, but the charism of the community really was to the most marginalized people and still is today. And so lifting up and, and serving those who do not have uh, opportunity and those who do not have the resources themselves to provide those resources so that they become the best people that they possibly can and that God has ordained them to be. The Sisters of Notre Dame came to the Cleveland Diocese in 1874 as teachers and since then throughout the diocese we've taught and administered in higher education, high schools, elementary schools, and now three Julie Billiard schools for students with special learning needs. Our most recent project is Notre Dame Village, a senior independent living campus in Chardon, Ohio. We have so much we can do as long as we don't think that we can do it alone. We always say we never do anything alone. <laughs> uh, that it's always in collaboration and cooperation with others. Another example of collaboration that is diocesan-wide was the recent conference, Our Common Home in Peril, Gathering for a Just and Sacred Future. It was held at Magnificat High School, and it was designed by sisters from various communities. It was in response to the Pope's encyclical of Laudato Si action plans. I think of all the ministries I've had, teacher, leader, admissions director at a nursing home, leadership is the most challenging and yet the most inspiring in terms of really feeling God present in the ups and downs and everything else. When the religious leadership teams joined together to form the Conference of Religious Leadership, known today as CORAL, they came together to share experiences to work together, to see what they had in common, to share each other's problems and to help be there for each other. One of the most fabulous organizations I belong to is CORAL. 
so good with each other. And we just kept on keeping on. And we encouraged each other to do what we, we needed to do. So Coral was very meaningful. I was in leadership in my own community. And when I was serving then, I got to know the other sisters in Coral. I want to say in some way fell in love with these folks because they they care, They their their lives make a difference. The Collinwood Outreach Project that grew out of Women in Spirit here in Cleveland, our sisters and several Notre Dame's, Ursulines, looked for a place in the city where the presence of women religious would make a difference. And they chose Collinwood. It was a fabulous, fabulous thing. It went for probably about five years. And I feel like lots of the collaborations that have happened, they may not be existing now, but we had a heck of a run. The discovery of human trafficking, grassroots, on the ground, first steps that sisters were taking around that, that it didn't come into church view or society's view until sisters brought it in. Immigration stuff, that the number of sisters who, even if they're not working full time, are volunteering with English as a second language for immigrants, finding a home, all kinds of stuff. But we were willing to move into an area even before we knew a lot about it because the need was that real. Collaborations, we, we wouldn't exist without them. Our founder, Mother Madeline, had a saying, I am delighted and blessed by the goodness of anyone who comes to our door to help us do something good for God and God's people. Our missionary work. This has been a very important part of our charism and our gift to the diocese. In 1968, two of our sisters were assigned to the missionary team in El Salvador. And on December 2nd, 1980, our own sister Dorothy Kazel, along with three other women, Mary Knowles sisters, Maura Clark, Eda Ford, and laywoman Jean Donovan, were murdered by Salvadoran guardsmen. Even though that happened, our sisters continue to minister to the people in El Salvador. Sometimes at your weakest points, that's when you really feel Jesus near you. After my leadership time as president, I didn't know what I was going to do. And God came knocking and said, why don't you be an interpreter? And so I first volunteered for interviews for people who were seeking asylum in the United States. And it's when they still had family court and so I began to do that. And that led to another incident of being an interpreter with the Cleveland Clinic and a group called Vocal Link, which gave me five years of going everywhere to people's homes and to hospitals and to surgical rooms, et cetera, as an interpreter. I'm working now, and I did while I was at the diocese with the refugee community. I've been with the people who come from Afghanistan and now from Ukraine, and I marvel at their courage and their resilience. I realize that for so many of them, what has kept them going is their belief in God, in the love of God. That is the gift, that is the charism of the Sisters of Notre Dame. And I pray that we continue to spread that message. I think it's the most important thing we do. Meeting the hungers of body, mind, and spirit in myriad ways. When I reflect on this time and this diocese, I think it's presence, it's the availability of the community to respond in any way that we can to the needs of people, of the church. We sisters are not the only ones called to be the face of Jesus in the world. We are all called, but we as sisters were called to continue being reminders to the people that this is our calling. This is our mission, that we continue to be the face of Christ here and now in this time in history.